Institute and the Environmental Change and Security Program. I'd like to welcome you all to the next in our series of Managing Our Planet. Our efforts here, which have been spearheaded by a joint advisor to both organizations, um, Tom Lovejoy, he's a professor at uh, George Mason University, as well as uh, a, an important official in the uh, Heinz Center, and also on the uh, Board of Advisors for the Brazil Institute, has been formulating uh, for a while the idea that essentially we've missed out on saving the planet uh, 1.0, and now we're uh, looking at the beta approach to 2.0. How do we really um, deal with the fact that we kind of missed our first uh, off-ramp uh, to, to uh, do things the right way, and we're trying to work our way through uh, and muddling into the 21st through the 21st century. And so oceans has been a recurrent theme uh, both uh, at the Managing Our Planet series as well as um, at both uh, at, at the um, Wilson Center and um, George Mason University. So we're really excited to be returning to this topic again uh, to look at the state of the oceans um, in the context of our guest today. I would also note um, a few technical points. One, we're uh, live webcasting this, um, so if you are asking a question, please make sure you grab a, uh, a, a microphone so we can hear your questions. Um, secondarily, we've got a Twitter going here, um, so if you tweet, uh, questions are answered. I'll be trying to look out for questions. Uh, the hashtag is managing our planet, and um, we'll try to keep up on that um, when we move to our discussion um, stage. With no further ado, I'd like to hand uh, the mic over t to um, Paul Schaff, uh, fellow professor at George Mason University. Thank you, Dan. Um, yes, so um, today we're going to address um, the state of the oceans. Uh, the, recently, the uh, International Panel on the State of the Oceans has come out with a report, uh, their, the almost annual report. Uh, they, they come out reports every so often. And this report has recently come out, and we thought it was a good time to take a look again at the, the state of our oceans and the issues that it's facing around the world. Um, we have with us today uh, Libby Jewett, who is uh, the director of the Ocean Acidification Program at the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and um, Karen Sack, who is the senior director for international oceans at the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, <coughs> We have outside here bios uh, of details, so we don't delay you here with a bunch of reading of, of everything's here. You're certainly welcome to uh, to go through that um, and uh, hear that. Um, so, what I thought I would do first is um, give a little discussion as a physical oceanographer uh, and climate scientist. Uh, kind of what the ocean's going through with the uh, climate change that's going on and how it's responding uh, physically. And then uh, Libby will tell us about uh, how that results in ocean acidification and uh, how we have a real problem with ocean acidification going on right now. And uh, then Karen will uh, fill us in on the uh, IPSO report and the state of the oceans and primarily international negotiation problems of trying to manage our planet, managing our ocean on the global scale. So uh, our oceans are uh, playing a big role in climate change. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has just come out with its uh, fifth assessment report from Working Group 1, which is the physical science basis. Um, there's two more reports coming out on uh, impacts and adaptation and uh, then mitigation measures that can be taken. But this physical science basis uh, looks at um, exactly how greenhouse uh, gases are warming the planet. Uh, for the oceans, there's uh, basically three key findings. No surprise, the ocean is warming up too. It's not just the atmosphere. Um, the oceans are storing virtually all the trapped heat, the extra heat that's getting trapped in by greenhouse gases. And the oceans are taking up a lot of the CO2. Okay. Uh, here's a map of the change in temperature from 1971 to 2010 of the top 700 meters of the ocean, just the very top of the ocean. Um, the data 
from 1971 to 2010. Uh, unlike atmospheric records, uh, there's very little data in the ocean. And the further back in time you go, the harder it gets to, to verify that. <coughs> uh, fortunately, we have reasonable data from 19, the early 70s on for the upper part of the ocean. And we're seeing warming throughout the ocean, especially in the North Atlantic. Um, if you look at the top 700 meters of the ocean, going from the North Pole to the South Pole, down through the depths in the ocean. The contour lines are the, are the average temperatures, but the red shaded areas is how much warming is going on. And so what we're seeing is that in the tropics where we have warming, it's very shallow. But as we get up to 60 north, where the cold water is coming out of the, uh, the uh, North Sea and, and up by Greenland, we're getting a lot of cold, a uh, lot of warming going down into the ocean. It's spreading down and spreading through the ocean. Um, but if you look at the really deep ocean, below 3,000 meters, we're even seeing warming all the way down in the bottom of the ocean, uh, especially around the southern ocean, where the deep water is being formed around the ice, around Antarctica. Um, this data, it's very small change. Five one hundredths of a degree is, is the dark red. Okay, so it's not very much change in temperature, but there's an awful lot of water with a lot of heat. Um, data is a real problem here. Uh, these lines are the hydrographic surveys that are used to make measurements that deep in the ocean. There aren't too many of them, but from that we can make these estimates, uh, they seem to be hanging together. But if we look now at the total heat that's been trapped from anthropogenic greenhouse gases, um, we can ask, where is that heat going? And this is the heat that's been accumulating since 1971. And the light blue is in the upper ocean. The dark blue is in the deep ocean. The white is the heat that's gone into melting ice. Um, the brown is how much gone into warming up the land surface. And this little bit here is the heat that's gone into warming up the atmosphere. Okay, So the atmosphere is getting warmer than anything else. The temperature has gone up the most, but very little heat. 93% <coughs> in the oceans, 3% <coughs> into the ice melt, about 3% into the land and the 1% into the atmosphere. So thank you, oceans. You're taking up a lot of the heat. They're also taking up an awful lot of the CO2 that's been released. It's estimated that 545 gigatons of carbon have been released between 1750 and 2011 from anthropogenic sources, chopping down the forest burning coal, oil. Um, of that, 545 gigatons, about 155 gigatons can be accounted for as increased carbon in the ocean from those sources. So um, the ocean's taking up about a third of the CO2 that we've been dumping into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, that's the kind of state of our knowledge as of the IPCC report from September of uh, how the oceans are responding to the, the climate change. Um, this physical change, taking up the heat, changing the temperature, is uh, a minor perturbation, but it has major consequences, and I think is taking up the CO2 is what Libby can now talk to us about as to uh, the serious consequences of what happens to that CO2 when it gets into the ocean. So, Libby? Should I stand? What do we prefer? Um, whenever, um, since you're, I think, uh, standing can, looks like it works, but if you're comfortable, please feel free. I think I'll sit. We'll see. <laughs> We're going to switch over. Um, 
And while you're switching, I just want to note, so so Paul had mentioned the IPCC Working Group 1 report, oh, which just came out in the last month. And one of the new developments within that is that ocean acidification is now recognized. And there were a number of nope. major bulleted points in the summary for policymakers that points this out. So I just want to draw that to your attention. I'm not going to be addressing the IPCC report today as much. But so um, without any further to, OK. So we did, um, I'm not going to go over this again too much, but just point out, um, as Paul said, that approximately 26 to 28 percent of all anthropogenically generated carbon um, is going into the ocean each year. So the ocean is providing us with a service. And um, for decades, um, there had been predictions that this was going to have ramifications for the chemistry of the ocean. Um, however, uh, many people sort of scoffed at that, including my professors, and I did a PhD not too long ago, who said, ah, oh, the ocean can just keep buffering and buffering and buffering. And well, now we know that's not no longer the case. And so I'm actually going to try to avoid going into the chemical equations here. Sometimes that people start glossing over when we get into that. So, but I am going to go into some of what the ramifications of this is. So we just to reiterate, you know, we're now at levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that are beyond um, measurements uh, for at least the last 400,000 years, if not much longer than that. Um, as you can see, 2013, way up, way up on the top of that chart. Um, so NOAA is actually involved in um, both oceanic research, but also atmospheric research. And it's through our global monitoring division that we are collecting CO2 measurements in air around the globe. And all those points around the globe are where we are actually doing sampling on a regular basis. And so this is a great animation, uh, basically showing on the left upper left-hand corner uh, the Earth breathing over time. And so the reason that the curve goes up and down is that the there's basically, when there's a lot of foliage in the northern hemisphere in the summer, um, there's a lot of uptake of a carbon dioxide. And then in the winter, it's letting that go. And so you have a regular breathing. But the, the important thing to note is that it's not just going up and down, but it's slowly inching up. And in the right-hand corner, so I'm going to go back. Now we'll focus on this, is the measurements of that um, the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and then the blue line right below that. So this is the top right, or this is the, the bottom right-hand graph, but the top of that um, showing how the level of carbon dioxide in the, in the ocean is increasing directly as a result. And then in the bottom section, you're seeing um, the measurement of pH is directly correlatedly decreasing simultaneously as the increase in carbon dioxide goes up. And then the other thing that's happening. So it's not just, we, we call it ocean acidification. That's a good name to sort of um, catch people's attention, um, indicate the direction of change of the ocean, of the chemistry of the ocean. But it's really, we're like basically perturbing the carbonate system of the ocean. And so it's not just pH, but we're also, as you see in the green line, seeing a decrease in what's called the carbonate ion. And the carbonate ion is a critical building block for calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is what? Oysters and corals and all shell building phytoplankton, coccolithophores, all of them are using calcium carbonate to build their shells. And if they have decreasing amounts of that in the water, they're going to have a harder and harder time to build their shells. So that's kind of the crux of the, of the problem. So we have now documented this in um, the global surface oceans. And since pre-industrial period, we now have documented a 0.1 
um, decrease in the pH scale, which is a 30% increase in acidity in the world's oceans. So not good. And um, this is actually a model showing over time, you'll see the, the dates up in the, the year in the upper right hand corner, um, using model projections for business as usual scenario for CO2 emissions in the atmosphere and showing the impact on the saturation state, so sat calcium carbonate saturation state of the surface oceans. And if we go back again, I'll just show it. So the red is, um, you know, super saturated, super, super saturated. That's good. And you can see as we progress through time that we're getting more and more down into the sort of greens and blues. And now I'm going to go into um, more details on how this can potentially affect uh, the, the function of the ocean. So that's our, so this is a, a modeling study that just came out this year uh, led by Ken Caldera, who has done a number of studies on ocean acidification. He's um, a modeler and actually does a fair amount of work directly in coral reef systems. And this is, so 400 ppm, that's what we're at today. And it's showing the number of uh, reefs that are living now in saturation states of three and above. And, um, you know, that pretty much covers most of our coral reef ecosystems. But as we move into even 550 PM, ppms, 900 ppms, which could be projected levels by the end of the century, you will notice that now those coral reefs are looking at needing to maintain their skeletons in uh, water that is chemically going to be chemically difficult for them. And studies have shown that it's, so we, we frequently look at one as kind of the, the, the operational level between um, saturated waters and unsaturated waters. That's when then calcium carbonate goes into, under, un, into dissolution. But what we have found through studies is that, um, that corals that are exposed to waters below about three or four um, uh, levels of aragonite saturation state, that they then are having, cannot keep up with the, um, the other stresses on the reef and cannot keep building their structure. Because a, a coral reef is all about being knocked down by fish and erosion and all you know other sorts of um, stresses, and then they're needing to constantly build their skeletons to keep up with that. Well, what we're finding is by the end of the century, we may have these coral reefs will not exist in in conditions where they can keep up. So um, now, and this is interesting studies that have been done on in coral reef systems. This was in Papua New Guinea. Um, one way that we're trying to get a, a sort of a view into the future of what we can expect in terms of coral reef ecosystems um, today is to look at these systems where we have naturally uh, low pH as a result of naturally bubbling CO2. So these are geological reservoirs of B CO2 that's bubbling out of those systems. And if we go and look at that, we can see what has happened over time because these can be in existence for tens of hundreds of thousands of years. And so if we look at, you know, a distance away from those systems and then we, we snorkel in or, or dive in towards the center where the CO2 is coming out, you can see the amount of diversity that you lose. And this is a result of that changing carbonate chemistry. So that's an eye into the future. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot that we're trying to figure out physiologically um, how organisms respond to this changing carbonate system. So it's the pH, it's the bicarbonate, it's the carbonate, it's all those, it's that equation that I didn't show you. Now you can go look it up when you get home. And all of the, the perturbation in all of those has ramifications for different parts of the systems, the physiology of these organisms. And so we have calcification as being a primary but there are also um, um, effects as diverse as um, neurological impacts on larval fish, where some studies have been done in Australia where 
clownfish, larval fish that are exposed to um, high levels of CO2 actually cannot sense their predators. And in fact, instead of choosing to go away from the predator, go towards the predator. And so how that'll play out, you know, in the bigger population perspective, we don't know, but obviously the indications are not good. Um, okay, so ocean acidification version 2.0. So 1.0 being, okay, CO2 increasing the atmosphere, changing the pH of the global oceans. Well, now we additionally have um, sort of added complication as you get near the coast because the coast is where you have rivers coming out, where you have excess nutrients from agriculture coming out, where you have cities, where you have people, where you have fish and phytoplankton and all the things that make coasts fantastic um, are also make it very chemically complex. And additionally, um, we are have a, a growing problem of Eutrophication of our coasts happens in the Chesapeake Bay, where we have an increase in the amount of low oxygen because too much nutrients are coming in, and it's it's actually causing blooms. And anyway, all of that actually, we've now determined also predisposes those systems to be more vulnerable to ocean acidification because all that biological activity is also putting out carbon dioxide. So you have that acidifying aspect, and then you have on top of that the, the increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So unfortunately, more bad news. But this is something we can probably locally control, um, whereas it's obviously more difficult to control the atmospheric levels of CO2, although I'm hopeful that as humans we will get to that. Um, so observation-wise, and I'll talk a little bit, I know I've probably gone over, but I'll talk a little bit about sort of NOAA's role in this, but the, the complexity here uh, when we talk about trying to observe the chemical change in, the, in our world's oceans is that the amount of sampling and observing that we have to do is more difficult as we get into the coast because there's more variability, both geographically and over time, because the seasons um, have an effect. So, we now have, back in 2009, uh, the Congress passed the Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act. Um, that established that NOAA would have an ocean acidification program. Um, it actually, we're the only agency that has specifically an, an OA program, although there are many um, agencies involved in our effort. I'm also chair of the Interagency Working Group, which was set up by Foram, and so we have NOAA and the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Geological Survey, NASA, Fish and Wildlife, EPA, Bureau of Energy and Management, Department of State, and USDA. So, and we're hoping to bring a few others into the fold, like, for instance, Department of Energy, I think, would be a nice addition, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and, and these are some of the sort of primary responsibilities that we as the program have. Um, so below, you know, fostering inter interdisciplinary research, establishing a long-term monitoring program for OA, that's, this is NOAA's responsibility, um, research to ident identify and develop adaptation strategies, educational opportunities, national public, just a few things <laughs> to address this rather large problem. Um, what we can say is that since 2009, we've had a, a large increase in the number of scientific publications. This is actually globally, um, there's a very robust international effort. So U.S. was a little late to the game, but I think we've ramped up pretty fast. Um, the Europeans have a very strong program, as does Australia, um, Korea, and New Zealand, and uh, a host of other countries. So we, luckily, we get to work together and play off and do collaborative efforts. So within the NOAA program, we do monitoring, and that's about half of our budget is going into that. We do biological and ecosystem response work. We have very strong focus on data management and sharing our data, not only across the U.S., but more broadly internationally. We have a nascent modeling program, although I think this is critical to inform the sort of bigger uh, uh, mitigation uh, strategies. Uh, we're involved in adaptation strategies and education and outreach. Um, in terms of our observing network, this is a snapshot of where we have um, 
chemical ocean observations happening. This is actually a buoy, um, which if you see all these red dots, they look like this or similar to that. Sometimes they have casings on them in which we're measuring CO2 in the atmosphere and in the water and the flux thereby and pH and oxygen and temperature and salinity and um, sometimes a few other things. Um, and we also have underway cruises, which are represented by the lines, and we have coral reef monitoring stations. So we're doing what we can. We have a lot of territory to cover, and our budgets, unfortunately, are going down a little bit each year, which is not good. So in terms of biological impacts, um, NOAA has primarily focused on our management responsibilities. So we are responsible for managing a number of um, federally managed commercial fishery species. And so we have directed a fair amount of our resources into our fishery science centers to actually test those species. So, you know, Alaska king crab and summer flounder on the East Coast and um, gooey ducks on the West Coast. And, you know, but actually there's like a long list of like this um, of the very species that we're, we are looking at. And then National Science Foundation has a very has had a very strong OA program, and they're looking at a whole host of other aspects of biological impacts. Um, we have a we have a, a pretty expansive uh, coral reef monitoring uh, program, uh, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. As our Pacific colleagues will note, half of the U.S. EEZ is in the Pacific, and so that is a very large territory to cover but we actually have a very robust sampling strategy and we work closely with the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, which is a program within NOAA. And then the next step is, okay, now we have some idea of what the direct impacts are on various species. Where, okay, where do they live? What's happening chemically in those areas? How vulnerable are those populations as a whole, those marine populations? And then additionally, how vulnerable are the communities that rely on those economically. And so we're trying to push our research all the way to can we predict the socioeconomic impacts and what is the vulnerability of certain um, you know, communities. So we were doing that in Alaska. Um, and now I am going to push on to a very specific example. So one that you may have heard of and which sort of brought a lot of attention to ocean acidification is what's happening in the Pacific Northwest off the U.S. West Coast, uh, particularly Oregon and Washington. And this is a result, this is ocean acidification, but as a result of the current systems, the way water moves off the West Coast. Um, the northern West Coast is primarily an upwelling system, which means when the wind is blowing from the north in the summer, particularly, you actually, the water is then pushed offshore and as a result, it pulls water from deep down up onto the coast. And traditionally, that's been awesome because it brings all these nutrients up. We have really good fisheries there. Um, and um, well, actually, I'm going to go on, well, I'll go there. Um, so, so this is actually uh, so, uh, some modeling work, but also we do surveys on the West Coast that are predicting, as we look over time, the level of undersaturation, again, of those calcium carbonate minerals off the West Coast. And this is actually the whole West Coast. But the red is an indication of the percent undersaturation. So that's, not, that's the bad side of the scale um, of the surface waters on the West Coast. And one thing that we've been able to measure in situ um, on our cruises this summer um, are, is actual dissolution of sea snails that find themselves in those undersaturated waters. And so these are actual pictures, and these are called pteropods, um, and they're critical, you know, early, um, low on the food chain, but they're, thing, they're very important in, for instance, the this diet of Pacific salmon. And so we, we have measured that. We don't know the ramifications population-wide for this, but we're, we've actually documented it in situ. So but now I'm going to jump forward and say, OK, we have those upwelling waters off the West Coast. Well, in 2005, 2006, um, oyster hatcheries, there are three primary oyster hatcheries in Washington and Oregon State on which the rest of the oyster industry in the Pacific Northwest relies for their hatch 
um, spat in order to to have a thriving oyster industry. So they buy the larvae from the oyster hatcheries and then grow them out, okay? In about 2005, 2006, th those hatcheries began to experience massive mortality and they didn't know what was going on. And they thought it was bac bacterial infection. They thought it was viruses. And they, they you know, did all the tests they needed to do for that, and it wasn't that. And then they thought maybe it was oxygen, but it wasn't oxygen. They, they, had, they knew that. They can control for that. Then those scientists in the industry had the opportunity to hear a talk by a NOAA scientist, Dick Feely, who's one of the premier scientists in this field, in which he was saying, this is, ocean acidification thing is real. We may potentially be seeing the impacts in the very near future. They're like, oh my God, this is it. This could be the problem. And so they invited the scientists to come in and start testing the water that they were pulling into their hatcheries. And it turned out that it, in those periods where they had massive mortality, the waters that were coming in were upwelled waters from very deep in combination with surface water, corrosive waters now that were affecting the livelihood of the, the, the larvae. And so once they knew this and could put it together, they could, they then could use predictions about when that upwelling water was coming in. They could either shut the gates so the water wasn't coming into the hatcheries or let it in, but um, add buffer to the waters in order to allow the oysters to survive. And they've actually brought the industry back. And they now are our biggest proponents um, in terms of uh, the, the benefits of research and observations in order to protect the livelihood of these um, of oysters. So this is actually showing a very good paper came out that was actually led by one of the, of the oyster hatchery scientists. Um, additionally, Washington State has gotten very active and has uh, written a number, uh, well, actually had a, a, what was called the Blue Room Panel on Ocean Acidification, a very intense process, very short process in which they had policymakers and scientists and NGOs and, sci and a whole range of people come together and figure out what are we gonna do. They proposed it to the governor, the governor um, signed an executive order and then proposed a budget to respond to ocean acidification. They ha now have an ocean acidification center at uh, University of Washington um, and they are funding uh, monitoring for that, for the industry. So, that is one kind of local adaptation success. Um, in the Northeast, now Maine is getting very uh, worried because their shellfish industry is actually the largest in the country. Uh, if you look at clams and um, primarily surf clams, I think is one of the biggest. Of course, they have lobsters as well. Um, and so we're beginning the process of putting together a Northeast coastal acidification network um, that will probably be observation-based, but also focused on what stakeholders need. So that's sort of the long and short of my talk. Um, OA is a direct chemical response to the rising atmospheric CO2. There's mounting evidence that such changes will change, challenge marine ecosystems. Models should help us predict future conditions, shaping both mitigation and adaptation decisions. Local mitigation efforts may offer some time. So that's it. Thank you, Libby. Yeah. So um, we will now try to. Uh... Uh, as we're setting up for the next um, uh, speaker, please uh, keep in mind we are uh, live um, and welcome those who are out there. Uh, if you'd like to send questions through our Twitter, um, hashtag <laughs> is managing our planet. Um, and we look forward to taking those uh, after our second presentation. Finally, someone who doesn't use a Mac has more technological skill. It's very exciting. <laughs> doesn't happen. Like that. Um, so thanks very much for hosting this panel. Um, I think the first thing I, I have to say is a disclaimer, which is that I am not a scientist. Um, so any of the scientific words or references in this document have been gleaned from other people. And if I misinterpret them, then I'm sure Libby will correct me, and I apologize in advance. Um, 
I was lucky enough <laughs> to be invited to be part of the international program on the state of the ocean, which is essentially a consortium of scientists, policymakers, and advocates, and government officials um, from different backgrounds who have now met twice um, over the past couple of years to basically share information um, from their different disciplines and come up with some recommendations on what needs, excuse me, to be done to push an agenda forward um, in terms of ocean conservation. Now, this is a little unusual. Um, often, as many of you will know, when scientists get together, there is a, a large amount of, of disagreement and uncertainty, um, and the step towards advocacy um, is often restrained by the scientific um, sense of uh, where there's still a little bit of uncertainty, we shouldn't leap forward into the abyss. Um, unfortunately for the scientists who were part of, of IPSO, uh, there were people like me who were there. And um, while we actually thought we would need to push the scientists a little bit towards some of the advocacy issues, what landed up happening is the scientists started pushing us um, because the science on what is happening to the global ocean um, is absolutely terrifying. And so that's my job today, to try and explain to you a little bit of, of, of how scary things are out there, but then also to take a step back and look at what actually can be achieved um, in terms of, of reasonable measures to, to mitigate um, and to stop or prevent some of the stresses that are acting upon the ocean environment. So essentially the bottom line um, from the IPSO uh, report key findings um, are that our oceans are in serious crisis. Um, the rate and speed of change on the global ocean are greater than at any time um, in, in known history, which is just that fact in itself kind of leads you to, to, to take a breath before going forward. Um, there's a, a pressing need to remove the immediate stresses, um, such as in particular overfishing and pollution, um, if we are going to have a fighting chance uh, against some of the climate impacts that both Paul and Libby have talked about today. And we urgently really need to close some of the gaps in global ocean governance if we are going to relieve um, some of the stress on those systems. So essentially what the IPSO um, findings came out with was they build on the IPCC report um, but go beyond it because we build a series of stresses onto that to show some of the cumulative impacts. So I'm going to very briefly walk through those findings. And um, first issue is the issue of deoxygenation. Um, you know, the, which we've just heard all about, the decreased levels of oxygen in the ocean um, caused both by climate change and nutrient uh, runoff. Um, and there are predictions that there would be a decline in oxygen levels in the ocean um, of, you know, between 1% and 7%. Pollutants that are, are adding to that um, you know, the, some of the legacy contaminants um, from the past, as well as emerging contaminants, um, which are actually particularly scary when you, you think about endocrine disruptors um, and some of the fragrances and pharmaceuticals that are having impacts on, on marine life. Um, and then, of course, plastics. Um, I think anyone who, who has ever read anything about the ocean has read about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, but more insidious than that are the small particulate um, uh, plastics that have become ubiquitous uh, across the global ocean. And then, of course, <laughs> the, the spread of, of dead zones. Um, talked about eutrophication. Um, and in this slide, the dead zones are, are the black areas. Um, interestingly, when uh, we were learning about this at the uh, IPSO meetings, um, lacking uh, is a lot of data from China. Um, and so that looks particularly clean, but nobody actually knows what's going on out there. And then, of course, there are um, the harmful algal blooms um, impacting coastal areas and um, also, of course, um, you know, uh, marine mammals, um, from manatees to dolphins and sea lions. 
Um, I'm not going to talk very much about acidification, um, except to say that um, there are these cascading consequences um, for ocean life. Um, there's the prediction that between 2030 and 2050, there could be large-scale extinctions of some coral species um, as a result of this. Um, and we can expect uh, significant serious consequences, um, particularly, you know, um, IPCC reports of um, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere of 450 to 500 parts per million as being um, highly significant in terms of uh, impacts on land. Um, my understanding, and Libby, this is one where you can correct me um, from the, the scientists that were part of IPSO, um, was that the uh, erosion at that level um, in the kind of coral structures and um, systems within the ocean will be actually uh, almost beyond repair at that point. Gets even more depressing when you add warming to it. Um, as Paul uh, showed us earlier, the oceans really are taking the brunt of, uh, of warming in the climate system. Uh, between 26 and 28 percent of CO2 is uh, uh, basically uh, being sequestered in, in the ocean. Um, you always have to think, people think of the surface of the ocean, but um, it's really important to think of the ocean in, in three dimensions. It's not just the surface area, it's actually the depth as well, and the importance of that depth range in sequestering CO2, but also in, in providing oxygen. Um, every second breath that we take uh, comes from the ocean. And so the combination of our oxygen, uh, um, our oceans becoming uh, um, condensed with CO2 and reduced oxygen has severe implications. We've got predictions of the disappearance of Arctic summer sea ice by 2037. Um, the increasing stratification of ocean uh, layers um, leading to oxygen depletion and the venting of methane, uh, which is becoming an increasing issue, uh, particularly in the Arctic seabed. Um, and that's a factor that's really not even discussed in the IPCC AR5 in much detail. But all of these impacts together are resulting in increased incidences of uh, low oxygen events. Um, and if you really kind of, we, we, we came up with this, this uh, saying of the deadly trio, um, you know, the result is uh, cascading consequences, um, meaning resulting in inhibited productivity and efficiency, altered food web dynamics, uh, the expansion of pathogens, changes in nutrient and oxygen supply, and changes to ocean temperature and chemistry. Um, and I think one of the important uh, points that Paul very briefly glossed over on one of his graphs was the impacts on deep ocean waters um, in, in the Antarctic. Um, pretty much all of the nutrients supplied through upwellings to the major coastal ecosystems around Africa and Latin America come from a, a, the currents that flow up through those upwellings into those coastal areas. And as those upwellings or the nutrient flow um, becomes impacted by this deadly trio, uh, the potential impacts on food security in those, e in those regions um, could be absolutely devastating. Um, I'm always told as an advocate never to use words like devastating, but um, unfortunately in this scenario it really is something that, the, again, the scientists were using. Thankfully, there is some good news. Um, <laughs> our oceans are, are very resilient, um, but it is imperative that to... Um, to, to, we need to help the ocean to maintain some of that resilience. And that means focusing on those stresses that we can abate in order um, to, to move things forward. So the single most direct impact that we as humans have on the ocean ecosystem is through industrial fishing and overfishing. Overfishing isn't just a threat to biological diversity. Um, there are significant food security concerns. About 85% of global fish stocks are fully exploited, overexploited, or depleted. 90% of the large fish, the tunas, the swordfish, are gone. <coughs> They've been overfished. That means, in, in a language I speak better, um, there's only about 10% left 
around the world. And there are some scientific estimates, though they, they, these are disputed, that by 2050, um, global commercial fisheries uh, could be in collapse. Why that's important, I'll get into in a little bit in terms of some of the food security issues. Um, but just remember, in some of the maps that we saw earlier, the concentrations of a lot of uh, where people are highly dependent on marine life as their primary source of protein are in the tropical belt in the middle. And as the oceans warm, the expectation is that fish will begin to migrate into more temperate areas um, as they follow the temperature of the water, which means that those folks who are most dependent on fish as their primary source of animal protein are going to be the ones who are in most trouble. Why we focus on the industrial fishing fleet is it's because it's the one that the North um, and developed countries have the greatest control over. There are about 1.3 1, million uh, industrial fishing vessels fishing the oceans um, with incredibly sophisticated technologies. The idea of a, you know, a, a, a wiry fisherman and his yellow slicker setting out for a few days to catch some fish for the local market is, is no longer something that's workable, uh, really, uh, particularly in areas beyond national jurisdiction, beyond the 200 nautical mile zone. And essentially, as a result of uh, economic incentives, such as subsidies, uh, the result has been literally that there are too many vessels um, catching too few fish. Um, and the fish stocks on the high seas, um, which really until the 1950s or 60s, um, were a fully protected no-take marine reserve, um, so that would have been 64% uh, of the planet. Um, now there is less than 1% protected. And I'm hoping this next slide is going to work. Um, this is a, a kind of catch uh, reconstruction from the Seas Around Us project um, to show how fisheries has ex have expanded since the 1950s with the uh, red, dark red being the year maximum uh, catch. And uh, it's, it's a little bit of a chilling representation. Again, if you think of the ocean in 3D, um, that's not just the surface area, that is all the way down, fishing to depths of about 3,000 meters now. So you add on top of that um, the, the governance gaps. And um, as a result of that, we call uh, many of the high seas and many exclusive economic zones where countries simply don't have the wherewithal to patrol those areas, um, the, the wild west of fishing. Um, there's a, a term that is used called illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. It actually developed as part of a fisheries management term um, where you couldn't um, account for an amount of fishing in the legal realm that's what it was called. So in many places, this is still not an illegal or criminal activity. But basically what it boils down to is uh, fishers stealing fish from waters that are either unregulated or that they are breaking the law to do that. Um, and this image, I think, speaks more than all the words that possibly could. This is a, it's probably a long line vessel. And the crew um, is, is bending over the side of the vessel. They're at sea, and they are painting over the name of the vessel. Um, and literally, that, that is absolutely possible to do. You can change names, you can change flags, you can change the country of registration. Uh, you literally have to go to a website, pay maybe $150, and you uh, are a new vessel flying under a different flag. And uh, that uh, enables uh, the laundering of illegally caught fish, um, overfishing, so management becomes really difficult. You may be trying to set catch limits at scientific levels, but you add in a, a, a massive unknown, and uh, you have a significant management problem. And then on top of that, uh, a lot of illegal and, and unreported fishing uh, happens uh, with gear that is some of the most destructive in the world. And, uh, and so that has not only impacts on the fish that are being targeted, but on the ecosystem as a whole. So. Um, if you look at all of these things, you begin to wonder what can actually be done. And um, I want to delve quickly into the realm of, of ocean governance um, and international law, <coughs> so bear with me. Um, there are some amazing things that have happened in multilateral environmental uh, law 
um, over the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, one of them really was the negotiation of the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention, of which the United States is one of the only non-parties left in the world. Um, although um, the US actually implements practically every part of the Law of the Sea Convention and in many ways much better than some of the countries that are parties to it. So it's a, a little odd, but, uh, but there it is. Um, and essentially, the Law of the Sea Convention is a constitution for the ocean. It sets the framework for how activities should happen um, in different parts of the ocean, and it outlines which parts are part of the territorial waters of a country, part of uh, what we call the exclusive economic zone over which states have certain rights to exploit natural resources, and then what is that area beyond national jurisdiction, the high seas, which is really the global commons. Um, it doesn't respond to every uh, issue, just like you know, the US Constitution doesn't deal with every issue out there, but it provides the framework with which you could address new and emerging issues. Um, the result of the implementation of the Law of the Sea Convention has largely been um, the creation of sectoral management structures, which I'm going to get into in a second. Um, the other result has been uh, a focus on the rights and freedoms enshrined in the Law of the Sea Convention rather than on the responsibilities that go with those rights and freedoms. So on the high seas, uh, you have the freedom of navigation and the freedom to fish. That freedom to fish has been something that has been held as a kind of law writ large. The concomitant responsibility to protect and preserve the marine environment um, has kind of been brushed aside. And that is one of the major issues on the table at the moment um, at, in discussion at the United Nations. When it comes to fisheries, um, what's happened, and, and uh, I'll just step back a little bit. I'm not going to go through the whole alphabet soup of international ocean governments, and it literally is an alphabet soup. But um, for any of you who do go and get the slideshow, um, the, in the speaking notes, uh, some of that soup is dispelled um, so that you can just see uh, in terms of pollution issues, in terms of shipping, um, and in terms of regional seas conventions, what's out there. But you know, I just wanted to focus a little bit on the, on the fisheries side, just to give you a, a taste of, of what's going on. So there are about 46 different fisheries bodies um, that have been set up to manage fisheries around the world. About 18 of those uh, are called regional fisheries management organizations um, and have been set up to manage uh, uh, fisheries on the high seas or with fisheries that are straddling or highly migratory between high seas excuse me, areas and uh, EEZs. And um, essentially those uh, organizations have, were set up to work out for states to cooperate, which they need to do under the Law of the Sea Convention, but the cooperation is in how you divide up the fish stock pie, not how you manage sustainable fisheries for a future in the context of a healthy ecosystem. And this is one of the major problems right now because um, while in other elements of international law there is much more of a focus on the precautionary principle and the ecosystem approach, the conventions that underpin some of these regional fisheries management organizations are all about getting the fish out of the water. And so there's a huge push to try and update those, uh, those convention texts, but that takes a long time. And obviously all of those regional management organizations are only as strong as the member states that are party to them make them. And so if the member states don't want them to change for whatever reason, they remain the same. So these are some of the issues on the table at the moment in terms of uh, international and global ocean governance. Um, there's the balance of the need to know versus the need to act. How much science do you need um, to be precautionary? Uh, and when does a lack of science, which is a huge issue when it comes to the ocean, um, it is probably one of the most understudied areas, particularly the deep ocean, um, anywhere. In fact, uh, the saying goes, there, there's more known about the surface of the moon than there is about the, the, the deep seabed. Um, so so when, how do you deal with that balance of what you know and what you don't do, know and taking action versus inaction? How do you manage in a, an area which is part of a global commons and there are different sectoral interests? So there's fishing versus shipping uh, versus uh, other 
potential types of extraction uh, emerging, such as deep sea mining, uh, particularly rare earth metals. That's the new kind of thing of the future uh, for all of our cell phones and other technology. Um, there are a lot of rare earth metals on the surface of, uh, uh, of the seafloor. Um, what happens when those start being exploited and other things such as uh, biological prospecting. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the organisms that are out there um, have interesting pharmaceutical, poten potential for pharmaceutical uses um, and there is no regime in place to regulate that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do when it comes to regional versus global management and what does regional <laughs> mean? Does that mean regional that fits political boundaries or should it be defined as regional uh, in terms of ecosystemic boundaries? So the Antarctic Treaty, for example, uh, goes out to 60 degrees south, uh, but its sister convention, which is a fisheries convention and, and actually one of the, the more um, progressive ones, uh, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, goes out to the Antarctic Convergence. So it follows the biological lines rather than the lines drawn on the map. <coughs> Um, if we want to update the Law of the Sea Convention, how do we do that? Is it possible to do it? Since that um, convention was negotiated, there were already um, have been two what are called implementing agreements to certain parts of the convention. Uh, one on uh, the, uh, re developing a regime for deep sea mining under the International Seabed Authority, and a second, which is the uh, UN uh, Straddling and Highly Migratory Fish Stocks Agreement, which is supposed to underpin all the management of those fish stocks. Those are, you know, the, the, the very, very valuable fish like tunas, um, and also, and that uh, regime is supposed to underpin the way regional fisheries management organisations uh, run their, org their their managements structures, but they haven't quite necessarily meshed up together. So do we need a third implementing agreement under UNCLOS, um, potentially to protect high seas biological diversity? Um, I mentioned the new and emerging uses and then the question of enforcement. Um, how do you survey, control and enforce what's going on um, in an area that is far, far away, uh, out of sight and in many cases out of mind? So coming out of the <coughs> IPSO group, but also um, from discussions that are going on at the, the UN and in various fora internationally, um, the question becomes how do we ensure a living ocean, particularly once we, uh, when we add the issue of this deadly trio. And the most important, simplest thing that you could actually do to ensure a living ocean would be to keep the oceans as healthy as possible. And how do you do that? you get rid of some of the most direct stresses that are unnecessary. So overfishing and destructive fishing are two of those. You create areas that are fully protected, just like national parks on land. Um, marine protected areas, particularly fully protected areas, the science is now showing that they are absolutely crucial in restocking uh, marine life, um, in building resilience, to change, particularly climate change, um, and in rebuilding uh, some of the fish populations and coral and other organisms that have been impacted through overfishing. In fact, there's a, a great anecdote um, from the Indian Ocean where the, around the Chagos Islands, which is now, which actually became the, fully, uh, the first fully protected uh, marine reserve in the world um, of uh, over 640,000 square kilometers, after the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which was a bit smaller. Uh, but that area when the tsunami hit was much more resilient uh, to damage because it was such a healthy ocean ecosystem. Um, and then making sure that where there are fisheries, they are sustainable. So applying precaution, applying the ecosystem approach, and then making sure that monitoring and enforcement work along with those. Um, so as part of it, so I was part of the, the group that looked at the governance um, issues that needed to be addressed. Um, we looked at the pros and cons of three potential opportunities, really soft change through the United Nations General Assembly. Um, the General Assembly passes resolutions each year on oceans and the law of the sea and sustainable fisheries. This is really soft law, it's non-binding, uh, but it has been uh, effective in the past. For example, the Driftnet moratorium, as well as uh, the extensive work that has been done to, co uh, to kind of restrain high seas uh, bottom trawling. 
um, have all come through the, the General Assembly, um, but it's a, a very long process, and again, it's soft law, it's not binding. Um, then we looked at uh, if we enhanced kind of the, the regional approach and we looked at regional organizations and instead of them simply being um, regional fisheries management organizations, uh, we could uh, get the precautionary <coughs> principle and ecosystem approach enshrined uh, within their uh, convention text. Uh, we could get the application of those principles so that there would be the closure of vulnerable areas. Um, perhaps uh, the requirement that, uh, that fishing uh, is only, just like in the US uh, under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, um, there's a requirement to end over fishing, so you set sustainable catch limits and you stick to those, and then of course you need monitoring and enforcement. And then we looked at a kind of far more ambitious overhaul of the system. And our conclusions um, were actually that while in the short term, um, it would be more costly and difficult to completely overhaul the system. The long-term benefit for the ocean and for the planet as a whole uh, would be much enhanced by overhauling the system um, in such a way that you could protect marine life uh, with the precautionary principle and the ecosystem approach built in and a recognition of these other stresses on the marine environment. So what we... Uh, suggested in this third uh, option would be a, a new implementing agreement under the Law of the Sea Convention. So it is an overhaul, but it's using our constitution uh, to adapt and change to uh, new circumstances. And essentially, you would build up the global infrastructure for high seas governance so that it could, number one, ensure that you could establish uh, high seas fully protected areas so take areas of the ocean and put them off limits to fishing. Um, and there's already a process uh, underway to identify where those uh, most highly biodiverse areas are. Of course, those are the areas that the fishers like to go the most, so it's ripe for conflict. But we have to do something. We can't leave our oceans as they are with less than 1% fully protected. And that number is even reduced for the high seas, where there is only one fully protected area in the just near the South Orkney Islands in the Southern Ocean is the only fully protected area of the high seas today. Um, that would need to be uh, meshed with a global high seas enforcement um, entity. Uh, Interpol has recently uh, become involved with fisheries enforcement. They have established a, a group called Project Scale under their environmental crime program and are beginning to look at um, how you deter and criminalize uh, illegal fishing. But there has to be something much broader than that. We have to make the playing field even. We have to stop those vessels that are stealing the world's fish from doing so and make sure that there is food security for those folks who are dependent on fish as their basic um, animal protein. Um, and within that argument go a whole lot of other security threats as well. Um, the Mumbai bombers, for example, used a fishing vessel to launch their attack on Mumbai. Uh, we have seen drugs being transported in the bellies of various fish and sharks um, on fishing vessels. And so the, the interactions between transnational organized crime, money laundering, and illegal fishing are all there. There's also a big issue of uh, um, human smuggling on fishing vessels and uh, uh, the use of almost slave labor on some fishing vessels um, because there's just no regulation. And then really, um, we have to take on the issue of overfishing. Um, you know, the issue of high seas bottom trawling has been on the international agenda for the past 13 years. Um, and while the majority of countries were actually in support of a UN moratorium on high seas bottom trawling, that effort was stopped by a few countries with a large interest in a bottom trawl fleet. And we can't continue to manage our planet in that way. Um, we've got to get rid of negative subsidies. Um, we've got to get, and that's how we, we get rid of the overcapacity. Um, the European Union at the moment is going through a huge debate on uh, reorganizing the way that uh, they um, manage their fisheries. Um, but there are elections coming up in Europe and when it comes to the question of subsidies, um, politicians don't necessarily want to take money away from those folks who vote for them if it's going to keep them happy. 
but it's a huge issue. And it's basically um, the bottom trawl fleet, for example, has been shown that if you got rid of the subsidies to that fleet, it would not be economically viable. There would not be a high seas bottom trawl fleet. Um, and, you know, as I said, combating illegal fishing becomes part of that. So there are things we can do, and there are things that the international community is motivated to do. The key now is to motivate the political will to achieve those goals. Um, there's a new initiative that uh, folks should be looking out at, um, which actually the IPSO report, the IPCC report, have fed into, and it's called the uh, Global Ocean Commission. Um, and this uh, consists of about 17 very high level uh, political movers and shakers from around the world. It's co-chaired by uh, Mr. David Miliband, who's a former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, uh, President Jose Maria Figueres, former President of Costa Rica, and uh, the Honorable Trevor Manuel, who is uh, currently a minister in the presidency of South Africa. And it's political leaders and business leaders who've decided that they need to focus their att attention on developing an action plan for the high seas. It'll be interesting to see if that kind of high level attention to this issue begins to gain the political traction we need in order to make a change. Um, but I think the wave is certainly growing for that change. And if we want to get past the issues of acidification and warming, which are, are with us, we need to work on those on land. But at sea, there are very specific things we can do to get our ocean out of peril. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Libby, and thank you, Karen, for two very interesting talks. Um, at this point, we open the floor to questions, and we'll try to get them around. And we have a microphone. <coughs> we need the microphone so we can get them on the, uh, here comes the microphone down front. And, and please tell us who you are and um, who the question is addressed to. So. Yes, uh, I'm Ed Barry with the Sustainable World Initiative. Uh, I, I thank you for a, a marvelous presentation. And one wish I would have is that every congressional leader, every legislature should hear this same presentation. Uh, and, and that's sort of also a question, and, and that is how are you getting this message into the political mandate, which is all talking about job growth and economic growth and more fossil fuels and everything else? Um, so that's one question. But the other question I'd like to put forward to you, and this is a bit provocative, but I want to say that although I agree with your recommendations, I think you're missing the boat. And, and that is that the, the fundamental problem here is that the scale of human activity is just causing multiple pressures, not only on the sea, but also on the land. And do we need to really create a law uh, that governs the sea, or do we need to govern ourselves to fit within the capacity of the planet to support us? When are we going to start thinking about whether or not our species is just simply out of proportion with what the planet can sustain? Thank you. Thank you. Um, who wants to take the first stab at that? I think that was at you, Karen. <laughs> I think to answer the second part first, and then go back to the first part, I think there has to be that recognition. Um, and that recognition has to be taken place, uh, taken at all levels of government, um, and ourselves as well. Um, and we have to shift what we are doing um, in order to recognize that the car carrying capacity of this planet um, you know, has tipped. Um, when I talk about precautionary principle and ecosystem approach, that's basically what those two things are about. And uh, because of the remit of this talk, I didn't go into a whole lot of other things, but we do need to change what we need to do. The perspective that we were trying to provide today was if you are looking at what are the things you can change most simply and directly in terms of impacts on the ocean, then these are things we can change and we can control. And in fact, in US waters, um, when the Magnuson-Stevens Act uh, um, was uh, reauthorized and the imperative to end overfishing began to be implemented, we have begun to see real changes in what has been happening in US waters. Um, 
the challenge is that not every country is like the US. You know, it's always amazing when I hear um, what NOAA is doing or other US agencies um, in terms of monitoring, um, in terms of the science that's going into these things. Most other countries in the world don't have a hope of doing this at all. And so what we need to identify are those things that could be most simply done now. Um, we don't have 30 or 40 years. Um, and yes, it sounds complicated to get a new law under the UN in order to change these things. Um, we need countries to take those steps uh, internationally together as soon as possible, not necessarily waiting. They can cooperate any time they want to. They've managed to cooperate to divide up how many fish they catch. They could certainly cooperate to set aside ocean areas. And it's a big discussion at the moment in the Southern Ocean um, where uh, there's recently been a decision that was just missed on protecting uh, over 1.3 million square kilometers of some of the most pristine ocean area uh, on the planet left in the Ross Sea. Um, the decision makers act by consensus in some of these bodies. Um, there were two countries that basically decided they were not going to agree with what was on the table, and therefore the decision was not made. Um, the US is one of the huge protagonists about protecting that area, and we expect those countries to go back um, and, and push for this again. So unfortunately, it's an iterative mm -hmm. process, and we all need to be doing as much as we can to push it along as much as possible. <coughs> in terms of speaking to political decision makers, um, there are groups around the country and around the world that do it all the time. And I know that for the, the charitable trusts, uh, we are more than happy uh, to go and, uh, and, and talk this uh, through and, and take action uh, with uh, those uh, government officials who want to make the changes. Um, Part of this is acting globally and part of it is acting locally and we need all of those elements. Yeah, I would just additionally, I'm not gonna go for long because I think that was Sorry. an awesome answer. No, that was that was good. Um, I have the advantage of uh, being a scientist and being located here very close to Congress. And so I have the opportunity to go talk to congressional members all the time and they, um, request information and we have some you know very strong champions who are also convincing their fellow legislators that this is something they need to be concerned about and ocean acidification has the additional um, advantage although I hate to call it that in that we ha have already seen impacts and so we can point to that economic connection and say you know, it could have near-term impacts for you, but we need to understand both, you know, from a U.S. perspective and globally what's happening. And and there, there is an openness to that conversation as long as we don't digress too much into the chemistry, <laughs> um, which we are want to do as scientists. We want everyone to understand that chemical equation. <laughs> but uh, sometimes we have to sit never back. Gonna happen, no, I know it's never <laughs> going to happen. We hope, we hope it will. So we're so. Um, but on that note, we are thinking very actively both um, within NOAA, beyond with the other agencies, and with our NGO colleagues and education colleagues to think about the message that we are putting out there. And so we think about, okay, what are the key things that we understand? Okay, how are we gonna say that now in a way that the most people will understand? And it's an ongoing dialogue because we do tend to digress into that. Oh, but we really need to explain everything. It's like, no, let's first get in the door, like explain it from a large, you know, perspective, and then get into the the chemicals, you know, specifics. Um, we also are doing a lot of work at the state level, you know, in coordination with state legislators who are very active, and inviting us to come and participate in their processes and provide our scientific expertise and, you know, observing to the extent that we can in their waters. And so they're, so it's amazing. I mean, I think we're actually exponentially increasing, although it's still not close to the number of people who understand climate change as a whole. Ocean acidification is sort of the newcomer, but. Okay, we have a question in the back of the room. There, there we go. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Eric. Uh, I have a question with regards to funding solutions. If the private sector is most responsible for ocean degradation, why is the focus to funding solutions so heavily placed on the public sector? Shouldn't we be engaging 
businesses in the private sector a little bit more. You can go yes. first if you want. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, the, the, Who's responsible for ocean acidification is who's responsible for greenhouse warming, uh, you know, global warming, CO2 emissions. And um, your, uh, you know, a response to that on all levels has been, um, you know, public sector response for what is essentially private sector uh, dumping. You know, just to add, the, again, the focus of this talk was very much on, on what needs to be done on a global scale and what the problems are. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that the private sector has got to be involved. And um, there are, are some elements within the private sector um, that are um, working mm -hmm. incredibly well um, to, to try and, and, and shift the current paradigm. Um, there are others who really like it just as it is. Um, and, and that becomes a challenge. And so the question becomes, do you engage in voluntary schemes with the private sector um, where those actors who would probably comply um, with whatever the rules would be are the ones who will comply, um, and those ones that are the bad actors are the ones that are still left being the bad actors. And we fundamentally believe that it's, it's important to have um, regulations and rules in place, uh, policies by governments, and it doesn't always have to be federal or international. Um, there's some amazing stuff that's going on at the city, uh, mm -hmm. state, and local level uh, to combat climate change, to implement uh, uh, sustainable fishing. Those are all part of the equation as well. Okay, we have a question down here in the front. And Dan, how do we have any online? Or um, we do, but my uh, power just failed, so I'll be <laughs> okay. Back. Fine. Well, when we get back to the <laughs> online questions, we'll ask Dan for uh, very quickly. Robert Shredder, international investor. I'm going to ask two simple technical questions. Um, one, uh, I think gravity is fairly uh, uh, balanced in its approach. So why is it, uh, Paul and, and uh, Libby, that both, you, both of you had a map seeming to indicate that there was more uh, deleterious activity in the southern hemisphere going on is that because of the depthness of the ocean when you showed globing global okay. warming when i was when i was showing the warming of the deep ocean the way you warm the deep ocean is well the how do you make, put water in the deep ocean in the first place okay w water sinks and forms the bottom of the ocean when it gets the coldest and the saltiest and therefore the most dense. And I guess my question is, is it there. deeper in is it deeper in the southern hemisphere than Yeah, it's in very the deep in the southern ocean. The Around Antarctica the and water same sinks. with acidification. Well so I want yeah, so so actually I'm trying to remember in my graphs, but it it's actually fairly equally bad in the poles. Okay. Okay, because cold water cold water just by thermodynamic uh, principles takes up more gas okay. than warm waters. It's denser for one thing. Well, it's okay. denser, but it's just colder, and so it can absorb more okay. uh, right. gas. It's like the CO2 get, stays in your Coke when it's right. cold. Thanks for those <laughs> for those non-scientists among us. No, that, that's, that's helpful, that's... but thanks. So, so my, my other smaller question is, you talked about uh, the acidification uh, impacts on a lot of um, plant and animal species right. we can see. Right. What about those that are getting mi more microscopic? How about plankton? Mm. How about uh, krill? You know, I mean, really tiny plant and animal life. Right. Uh, well, do we so know the, what the impact is there? So the those um, SEM photographs that I showed of the shells that were dissolving are actually a very critical plankton component of our ocean. So they're these tiny sea snails that make up, I mean, are, are actually spread throughout our world's oceans and are the bottom of the food chain, close to the algae, but not quite there to the phytoplankton. Um, and, and they are, we think, in peril because they are actually dissolving in situ when they're exposed to these corrosive waters. And they're responsible for a lot of oxygen. Now, they, they are not. They're actually eating plant, other plants and stuff. But phytoplankton, so there are phytoplankton that actually protect themselves by putting these plates of armor around themselves. Now, this is all very microscopic. And um, experiments have been done. So these are 
Emiliana Huxley, for those of you who want to go look that up, but um, they're called coccolithophores, and they put these little coccoliths around themselves to protect themselves. And experiments have been done on a range of those sort of different populations. And some, you know, because CO2, I mean, plants take up carbon dioxide. That's what trees do. So plants are taking up carbon dioxide. So it could have a positive effect, but if they're building their shells, it could have a negative effect. And there's actually mixed response on the part of some of those algae. Now, there are harmful algal blooms, which you mentioned, is a new area of research. And some indications are that some of those harmful algal blooms, specifically the ones on the Pacific, again, in the west coast of the US, may actually become more toxic in response to rising levels of CO2. So we're, we're, ha we're, you know, we're still in that phase where we're hoping that some things will do better. Um, some things are we're, you know, either not responding or doing better. And then many more things are, are negatively responding. And in terms of how it all fits together is still, you know, we're still figuring out. And, and just on krill, because it's a really important species, um, right. whether it's in the northern hemisphere or in the south, this is where you begin to see these cumulative impacts. So it's not just the acidification, but it's also the retreating sea ice, mm -hmm. because the krill swarm and, and breed Feed on, and, the underside, uh, and, and, uh, on the underside of that sea ice. Right. And so um, as that retreats, the question becomes what happens to the krill populations, and those these are the forage species that form the basis of the entire food chain in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And of course, now we humans have just developed this amazing technology. It's, it's kind of like a huge vacuum cleaner. It used to be very difficult to fish for krill because they begin to decompose as soon as you get them out of the water. Um, but there are some companies, uh, particularly from Norway, that have developed some new technology that you can literally vacuum them out and flash freeze them immediately, um, which is why they're popping up, you know, at your local Costco in little, uh, you know, Free capsules. Krill. No, little capsules, <laughs> the krill oil, and they're being fed to farmed fish. And this mm. could have, you know, if this fishery expands, it, mm. it could have huge implications on the entire ecosystem of those those areas. Okay, um, Dan's not ready yet. So we have a question over here, and then we'll come into the middle here. So. I think this question is for Karen Sack. I'm Mike Gravitz from the Marine Conservation Institute. We've been working on marine protected areas for a long time. Um, and are, of course, worried as you are about species, lots of species extinctions in the ocean, uh, the rapidly changing levels of CO2 and, and warmth and all the rest. One of the things you uh, all talked a lot about are sort of command and control changes, changing treaties, uh, making regulations tighter, et cetera. And our question, something we're thinking a lot about in, in the context of something we call the Global Ocean Refuge System, or GLORIES, is how to give incentives to countries. Um, and so this would concern mostly EEZs, the places they control, not high seas. How to give countries positive incentives, uh, because the negative ones don't seem to be working very well right now. How to give them positive incentives to set aside the NPAs, the marine protected areas and uh, create them as sort of strongly protected or no fishing or almost no fishing. And so the question is, are other people thinking about this? And if so, what kinds of economic incentives, and maybe, maybe they relate to uh, private industries of various sorts, maybe tourism, maybe whatever, um, what kinds of incentives do you see on the horizon that would enable countries to really look for and want to preserve and strongly protected MPAs, some of their some of their areas. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That's it's a great question, and it, it's it, you know we we often get stuck in the negative incentive issue, um, but the positive incentives are really important. Um, when it comes to the creation of uh, fully protected reserves, um, some of the areas that would be best protected are those areas around small island nations, um, and there is huge tourism potential for those countries. Um, we've done some work um, actually in establishing both shark sanctuaries and uh, fully protected marine reserves uh, 
in various places. And the economic argument is incredibly strong. Um, you know, there aren't, uh, as you know, in the sea, there are no borders, there are no fences. Um, there's an amazing spillover effect um, when you, you create these reserve and fully protected areas in terms of providing more fish for food as well. So there's the, the food economy, particularly for small island states. Um, but ecotourism is one of the growing um, aspects. Um, we, we did a study in Palau several years ago, and we found that the value of a, life, a live reef shark, um, and I hope I don't get the numbers wrong, it was several years ago, is something like over the, the lifetime of that shark, which is about 15 to 19 years, about $300,000 versus a dead shark, um, which actually has no value to the economy at all, but on the market, the fins could be about $100 or so. And so whale shark tourism, those kind of things can really build those economies. Um, the Australian government recently established the Coral Sea Marine Park. Uh, a lot of the argumentation behind that, um, and there's some great studies, which I'm happy to provide you with, are underpinned by economic arguments. Um, Bermuda is currently looking at establishing a, a fully protected reserve um, in its waters. It would leave a certain area just around the, we're calling it a blue halo, uh, a certain area uh, just around the, the coast for local fishing um, and the economic arguments to underpin that as well. Um, but I think there's some of the, the shifts we need to make in creating those arguments are not just looking at the, the, you know, the, the regular economic benefits. Um, but building in some of the externalities that we never build in. What is the cost of wiping out a mangrove um, in terms of the potential impacts from a negative storm event? Uh, what are the costs of, you know, or the benefits of increasing the resilience um, and diversity of a reef in terms of carbon sequestration? Um, building in some of those costs, I think, is imperative for us to do in order to push this agenda forward. Okay, we had in the center here. And then we'll get over to you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Sasha Kuashima, uh, formerly the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, now with the US EPA. I have a question for Karen and maybe Libby, if you can um, shed more light on what do you expect and uh, from policymakers on a, a number of these very complex uh, situations. Um, there, there are many of them are um, a pressures exerted on different sectors. You know, you're trying to develop policies for a certain sector that's outside of, you know. So these kind of issues are very difficult. And you point out all these different conventions and laws, which are um, not readily available for certain policymakers at certain levels of government to recognize mm -hmm. that there are these complex complications and, and interconnections between whatever they're trying to make. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about that hasn't been touched on in terms of overfishing and, and destructive fishing is the role of aquaculture in this case. Um, and uh, in, in referring to that, China, you say you didn't have all the data on hypoxia. There are a lot of data you know, released uh, through Jeff mechanisms and, and expert panels, and there are a number of hypoxic zones in East China Sea. Uh, in fact, if you look at a Google map, you will see the shallow water is not blue, it's very dark, and that's because they have a number of aquaculture yeah. facilities there. Um, so the, there are a number of, uh, you know, hot hot spots and 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 certain um, policy issues that if you can shed I, shed light on the key ones that you think um, that we could address. Whew, I could be here for the rest of the week. Um, <laughs> on the sectoral management issues, um, one of the suggestions that's actually in our paper and that's bubbling around is the idea of regional ocean management organisations. Um, trying to layer some of those sectors on top of one another so that they're not all being organized separately. There's actually, there's no single unifying body um, where you can sit down and talk about issues impacting the ocean and actually get decisions made at the moment. Um, there used to be an undersecretary for oceans at the UN, um, but that post was done away with. Um, so the question is, could you re-empower some of the UN secretariat structures um, so that you could 
bring in more transparency, you could bring in greater accountability so that all of these regional organizations are held to the same standard and you don't land up in the current situation where you know, a vessel can go forum shopping. If they're caught out in the North Atlantic, they can go to the South Atlantic and then they can move you know, to the South Indian Ocean, et cetera, et cetera. So, so how do you um, begin to get rid of some of those sectoral differences and make sure that there's a level playing field? Um, potentially uh, through requiring that there is more accountability at the UN would be one. Those folks who don't think the UN achieves very much, of which I am certainly not one, I think on the oceans the UN is absolutely essential uh, to taking the agenda forward. Um, you know, th there have to be a, a number of different mechanisms, but we somehow got to get these different fora talking to one another and having the same rules in place um, so that you, you just, you can't evade the rules by moving, which is what vessels do. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of aquaculture, uh, this is a huge, huge issue. And um, I think Eric was the person who asked the question about engaging with the private sector. Well, that's the private sector. Um, one of the challenges with aquaculture is what do you feed those fish that you're farming? And if they are carnivorous finfish, like salmon, um, you are feeding them other fish that you have had to take out of the ocean ecosystem in order to feed them so that we can eat them. Um, so that's one terrible impact. There's also the issue of, of what's happening in, in coastal areas. And I think this is something that really has to be focused on in, in great detail, particularly when we look at acidification and climate change, because of the importance of those coastal areas, particularly mangroves and coral reefs as buffer zones. Um, for storm events. Um, we can't just ignore those things anymore. And I think at some point, countries who have authority in those areas have to make some serious decisions about what is more important for the food security, the resource security, and the national security of the people who live there. Um, I think some of the policies that have been undertaken, um, and, and I have to say Pew actually doesn't currently work on aquaculture, um, so this is me speaking personally, um, they've been very short-sighted. Um, and the result, if you look around the coast of Chile, um, if you look at what's been happening, you know, as you said, in China, in Thailand with shrimp farming, um, th they've just destroyed entire ecosystems, picked up and moved into the next place. And I think it's really important um, that, that that issue begins to be looked at as farming not being the answer to the food security issues, but actually being an additive stress to the marine and coastal environment, which is not going to help with long-term security. Can I just add one point on that for aquaculture? Sure. I think I think they're, I think you're right, and I think that the coastal systems are where we would deploy aquaculture um, industries and where they are. Um, however. It depends also on whether you're looking at fish or, or you're looking at shellfish mm -hmm. or oysters and mussels, which actually have a very beneficial impact on ecosystems by taking in the phytoplankton that may be overproducing in a eutrophic system. Yeah. However, um, especially, and I just want to make this point because I didn't in my presentation, the west coasts of our continents are particularly vulnerable to ocean acidification because of this upwelling phenomena. And Chile, which you mentioned, um, has a very robust aquaculture industry. And they are very worried about ocean mm -hmm. acidification as well. We actually don't even know what's happening on the west coast of Africa because we don't have any observing systems here. And yet they also are very reliant on aquaculture and shellfish and maybe native shellfish. So you know, there's a lot that we need to understand. and. I'm actually one of the co-chairs of this new entity when we talk about international frameworks, which currently is not sitting under any of the UN bodies yet, but we're interacting with them, um, called the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And we've gotten recognition in the Rio Plus 20 documents, and you know, so there, there is an understanding, and we actually presented on this at the, the UN informal consultative process on the law of the sea. So we're getting information into all these UN documents, thinking that if we just spread it out, at some point something's going to take and we'll, you know, we'll get some action items. But um, we're pulling together scientists and governments and all of these other frameworks through global ocean observing, et cetera, 
um, to try and build a network that can provide global information and local information about what's happening with OA and what might be happening so that they will know what's happening and perhaps can um, use that information to decide where to place aquaculture facilities, you know, uh, from a shellfish perspective, so. Okay, we have um, one right there, and then Dan, yeah. Dan will have one, so. Um, my name is Bianca DeLille. I'm a, an environmental media consultant. And my question was also on aquaculture, but it was slightly different. Is, is the fact that there's um, aquaculture taking the pressure off pol politicians to do anything about controlling, you know, um, deep sea fishing, destructive fishing, and all that, because there's fish in the grocery store and no one's pressuring them? I mean, like go to the grocery store now, there aren't any wild fish very often. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the, actually, this should be a question that goes back at you, which is one of the biggest challenges in working in this field is you walk into a, a, a supermarket, you walk into a fish market, you go to Japan and you go to the fish market there, you go to Spain to the markets, they're absolutely full of fish. <coughs> the question is, are, is the makeup of that fish changing? And one of the interesting um, pieces of information that's beginning to come out is that some of the folks who are, are actually becoming most concerned about the state of the ocean are the people who are buying that fish, um, particularly the small um, restaurateurs who are having to shift what they're doing because the fish is disappearing. Now, the challenge becomes, how do you use that in order to shift what's going on? And, and for us, um, Daniel Pauly from the University of, of British Columbia you know, coined this term of fishing down the food chain and fishing down the food web. And we've seen this in Alaska. We've seen it in the Southern Ocean. Um, we've seen it everywhere um, where, you know, as you fish out one species, I mean, cod is the perfect example, right? You fish, the cod have still not returned um, to the Canadian Atlantic. Um, so what have <coughs> they done? They've shifted the fishery entirely and they, you know, are fine now the cod are not coming back, but the fishery has changed, the ecosystem has changed, and it'll never, it'll never change back again. I think part of this is, this is where the private sector can become involved. Um, and their groups, uh, I know, you know, Greenpeace, WWF, uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, it just goes on and on. You know, they've all got little fish cards and procurement policies. I think those things are very important to put some pressure on the retail sector no, there are times when the retail sector should be saying, no, we will not stock fish that has been bottom trawled. We will not stock fish where the biomass has been reduced beyond a certain amount. Um, you know, those are the kind of things that we need to see starting to happen. And we as consumers need to ask those questions. Um, my, my family is always completely mortified when we go out. In fact, they choose restaurants. Um, that never have fish on the menu because I just can't resist, right, can't resist, um, you know, when I see what's on the menu having to raise a question and they kind of say, oh, mom, you know, just please, not just this once, just please, just don't do it. And um, that happens to you too. <laughs> and, but, I, but it's important that we do it um, because otherwise, you know, it, we are part of the problem. You know, Orange Ruffy is a wonderful example. An Orange Ruffy is actually a, a, it's the marketing name for a slime head. It's deep sea fish. Um, it is a, a fish that actually, when you're generally eating the piece of fish on your plate, it's probably older than your grandmother, 135 years old. It doesn't spawn until it's about 30. Um, and yet it became, you know, this boom and bust fishery, completely targeted at white table um, cloth restaurants in the United States and Europe. Um, and, and we need to stop that kind of thing. Um, and we need to look at it and, you know, Patagonian toothfish, or, which is the regular name for Chilean sea bass, another example. Um, I always get the question of, oh, now they have, you know, we can get them. So, you know, if whole right. food sells it, it must be fine. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, that fishery has been decimated all the way around the Southern Ocean. There are some small pockets remaining. It's just not fine. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. Eric um, J. Um, Pacheco. I I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. 
who's also been a good uh, commentator during our discussion today. Um, I think this is a question for Karen. Um, if the private sector is most responsible for ocean degradation, um, why is the solution so much focused on the public sector? This speaks a little bit to what you were just saying, but mm. you might want to elaborate. Because the, the ocean is a common resource. The, yeah. the private sector does not own what is in the ocean. We do. Uh, we as the public. And we need to make our government officials accountable to us and not allow them to sell off those common resources to private interests. The, uh, the tragedy of the commons is the commons. I mean, you know, we, we have this common resource and it's totally unmanaged. Um, okay, uh, so let's get a microphone over this side of the room, down midway down, and then we'll come down to the front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Victor Bullen. I'm the Bureau Environmental Officer for U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, recently, Haiti created a significant marine coastal marine protected area on the north coast uh, with the help of UNDP and Global Environmental Facility and Inter-American Development Bank. Um, <coughs> do, um, what are some other mechanisms or what are you thinking about in terms of mechanisms to encourage uh, countries to create uh, similar protected areas? It, it seems like if Haiti can do it, the poorest country in the hemisphere, um, I mean, other countries should be able to <coughs> as well. And I, I have a totally unrelated question as well. Um, if you don't mind, um, the uh, for for um, aquaculture um, shellfish uh, industries, is it really practical and and um, economical to buffer water that's uh, acidified? Um, I mean, in order to make a go out of it. That, that's all. You want me to take that and then you go? Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, it definitely is not. Uh, economically feasible to buffer the coastal ocean or even an estuary. It's just the amount of energy that would have to go into p p putting alkalinity into that system to bring it back to manageable levels is beyond. I mean, we haven't figured it out yet. But to, to buffer a closed system which is what's happened on the in the Pacific Northwest in these hatcheries, is the difference between having a business and not having a business, and they are willing to make that investment. Now they are obviously living on close margins, and um, you know that's why there's been some public-private partnership there to you know bring the scientific expertise in to help them do that monitoring. But we're trying to actually. Um, make sure that those technologies are more widely available at lower cost. So we're so we're working with technology companies as well. So I don't know, you know, long term. I'm I'm not an industry, you know, owner or scientist. I think it's going to become harder and harder because obviously the conditions are changing, and and we can't obviously, you know, in the grow out. That's the next phase. Now the larvae tend to be the ones that are particularly vulnerable. And what we found so far is if we can get them over that stage, which is the first six days of life, then they seem to be more resilient to widely varying system or, con or conditions after that. But as the whole system starts to tip into being more acidic, you know, even though it's varying widely, which is just what how coastal systems act, um, you know, all bets are off. So, so on the MPA question. I was going to deflect to Mike, who probably knows the answer better th than me. So maybe the two of you can have a bilateral after this. Um, <laughs> there, there is a lot of work being done um, all over the world in many coastal areas, and in particularly in developing states, um, to create protected areas, small scale, medium scale. Um, we don't actually work on those, um, but there are a number of groups that do, and all of that is 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 absolutely key. Um, our focus is on creating the very large fully protected areas to add to this kind of global momentum. Um, but I think the example of Haiti is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, if Haiti can do it, um, then any other country in the world can do it. And we should really be encouraging that. 
Okay, so then we had one all the way down the front here. <coughs> Hi, I'm Hugh McElreft. I'm a retired naval officer. I apologize in the you know last 10 minutes. I'm uh, the only question that comes into my mind probably demands an hour long uh, tutorial. It was alluded to this idea of putting something in the ocean. I think what's been proposed or um, unauthorized, experimented with, has been with a view to fixing carbon mm -hmm. to take it out of the atmosphere. But what I don't understand is what does that do to the ocean? Right. And I'm not really asking you for a boo yay on this, but just can you give me, you know, a 30 second on the chemistry? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, an invitation the, to chemistry. Right. <laughs> well, this, the theory is so there. There was a lot of um, conversation and, and actual work that was happening in the last, you know, three or four years ago about this idea of ocean fertilization, where we would go out and strew iron basically over large swaths of the open ocean, and with the intention of of creating phytoplankton blooms that would then pull CO two out of the atmosphere. There was. Um, a lot of uh, worry about the scale of, of these um, potential mitigation actions and what the fate of that carbon would be. Um, is it in fact because of, you know, there are all these other changes that are happening on top of the acidification op, uh, or, um, or activity, um, is the intent would be that you would be pulling that carbon all the way down into the deep ocean um, and hopefully it would stay there, but actually it doesn't ever stay there forever. Eventually it comes back up. So we're sort of turfing it off maybe to a couple hundred years down the line um, when it would belch back up. And maybe we don't care about those future generations, but I think I probably would. Um, but, but long and short is that there was a decision that, yes, we need to look at that as an option. We need to study it um, because there are a lot of interactions there that, um, could actually exacerbate um, carbon or acidification in that if it doesn't go deep enough, if it's sort of at the bottom of the first layer and then it it gets degraded with ba by bacteria, it's then actually adding CO2 into that surface layer and then you have the atmospheric CO2 on top. So it actually could exacerbate the situation. And additionally, if you end up doing that sort of activity as you know, thinking, oh, well, I can just apply this anywhere, and you bring it into the coastal zone where there's all this other biogeochemical complexity I talked about, you actually would also be exacerbating you know, the dead zones, which you have talked about. So I think there's a universal sort of thinking that, OK, let, we need to do more studies of this before we could actually say that, it would, that it's a good idea. The only science that has shown that there is a good way of sequestering carbon or CO2 in the ocean that can be successful in the long term is by having more bigger fish and other animals. All of those, it's, uh, this is my campaign technically called Fish Poop for the Planet. <laughs> it's uh, whales sequester a lot of carbon. Um, big fish, the, the more there are, the better it is in terms of getting carbon down into that base layer. Um, it's the, the simplest thing we can do is ha to have healthier oceans and to sequester more carbon. So, um, you know, that 22 to 26 percent of the CO2 coming out of the atmosphere in the ocean is our first experiment in carbon capture and, and <laughs> sequestration, except we, we realized that it's causing all this ocean acidification problem. Um, so I uh, think we've come to our time here. We have one more? Yeah, well, uh, actually, um, <coughs> one, one last uh, comment. We have the, we you have a, a citation thing. Um, no, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, the, um, uh, we have a couple of high school students here and some watching over the internet right now. Um, so in the, all the doom and gloom, any sage advice for, um, for the next generation of scientists and policymakers that they represent? So, so we actually get that question answered quite a, or question asked quite a bit. Um, you know, you're talking about global change of the oceans. 
and and then you ask people to recycle more and it just feels like a disconnect between this massive change that is happening and what I can do individually and one of the sort of new thoughts on messaging about it and I think one of the actions that we can think about is as Karen alluded to is working for solutions within your community and there are things that are happening in cities there are um, you know, thinking about alternative energy options, you know, challenges that go on in neighborhoods about reducing your carbon footprint. I think that sort of activity could actually create a groundswell. And really the only solution for ocean acidification um, is reducing the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And, you know, the the flip side is that you become just a fantastic engineer and you figure out how to suck it out of the atmosphere, which I keep posing to different people and saying, you're going to figure that out and, you know, we'll pull it, we'll have to put it somewhere. I mean, that's kind of part of that equation, but, you know, let's have an X prize, like a Manhattan project for figuring out how we can bring the carbon budget back into balance. No, I, I guess very briefly, what I would say is, um, it's 